Hello, hello, good morning, good morning. I'm Jennifer Brennan. I'm the horticulture information specialist here at Chalet and uh, the, the, webinar, the webinar lady. And um, we're gonna uh, get started at 10 a.m., which it looks like is just 15 minutes from my computer clock. And, um, and this is watering the life-saving habit. Um, when um, Tony Palmer and I, we're working together when Tony was um, still the manager of the, um, the retail uh, center here at Chalet. And gosh, this was probably, oh, I would say 25 years ago. I've been here 31 years. And because we warranty um, plants, especially plants that, well, we warranty all of our plants, our woody plants, our woody trees and shrubs. And if you have played, if you have paid the planting fee, for chalet to plant it, then the plants are warranted for um, replacement if they die anytime within that first year. 100% replacement where we just come in, we take out the old, we replace it with a, a new one, and that's how it works. Um, if you opt to plant a, a woody tree or shrub yourself, it is still warranted, but for 50% replacement value. So whatever you paid, for the, uh, the woody tree or shrub, you get half of that back to apply to the replacement plant that, that, that you've selected. And that's also good for one full year. So, so when Tony and I realized, uh, we'd had some really rough, you know, drought, droughty summers, we realized people just did not understand the importance of watering and how to water. So we decided we, we needed to start sharing that knowledge with our customers. And so when, when I was running the, the learning center, we started doing these lectures and Tony and I would take turns as to who would do the presentation of it. And um, I, did some, I did some really fun, fun research. And uh, Dr. Ed you know, Gilmore down out of the University of Florida has done some incredible uh, research on the amount of water and the timing of waterings. And so I'm gonna share that with you today. So um, let me just check something here. I'm gonna go ahead and pop this up. Ooh, and I've got two people. Welcome, welcome. It's me and somebody else that signed in. So welcome to Chalet's webinars. And we'll, we'll be getting started. It looks like it's 13 minutes away from the start time. So um, the, uh, in, in, in the, um, email that gave you the link to, to this webinar. There was also um, a, a link in that webinar. It's, it's like a PDF file uh, to print up the handout. And all of the handout has all the information that's on, um, on most of the screens of, of the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. So it saves you from having to take a whole bunch of notes. So um, here we go. And I think what I'll do I think I am going to go ahead and do start the share. Here we go. All right. Oh, no, no, no. Here it is. Share the screen. Ah. Here it is. I have a really neat title slide. Oh, go back to the title slide, Jennifer. Okay. Here we go. Oh, the title slide's kind of cool. Let, let's just get started from the beginning. Oh, oh, look, how's, how fun is that? So now anybody that signs in knows they're at the right spot because they can see the title of Watering the Life-Saving Habit. Okay. Oh, that's not good. Backspace. All righty. Okay. That we still have 10 minutes. So this um, Zoom thing is starting to feel a little comfortable. You notice I said a little comfortable because um, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to be too confident whenever it comes to anything that's computer oriented. <laughs> okay. And I switched my beverage of choice. So instead of drinking hot coffee, I have my wonderful iced tea. You just can't have enough iced tea. Can you? you can tell I grew up down south. 
but I don't drink sweet tea because I come from a long line of family members who are adult onset diabetic. So I learned to avoid the sweet in the sweet tea, but you just can't beat a good fresh glass of um, freshly brewed iced tea. And it's gotta be black tea, gotta be black tea. Okay, so as I've talked about it, I better take a sip. Mm. Wow, is that good. I pack my Yeti full of ice from the top to the bottom and then fill, fill the iced tea in it. And there's ice in it, even, even at dinner time. Is that cool? Nothing like a Yeti, nothing like a Yeti. And my best, my best friend, Renee, gave these to me as a gift. I have two. I have one for the cold, my iced tea or ice water, and one for the hot, which is my coffee. And, and, and I don't have to lift as many weights because I carry these. <laughs> I think you're going to really enjoy this, um, and and there's a lot of really good information that I, I think is really really helpful. And when you understand the why and the how water flows through a plant, you'll understand why it's really important to make sure they always have enough water available to them. So it was fun. It was fun. It was fun being a real geek and doing the research on, on, on this one. And what's fun is um, I, I, up, I update it every year. I, I found out, I found some neat new information a year ago that I was able to add. Oh, I see another person signed on. Welcome, welcome. And you can tell from the screen that you're at the right spot. This is the watering um, webinar, uh, the, the watering presentation and the life-saving habit for our, for our plants. And we'll get started in, let me see. Oh, it's about six minutes away from start time. I had a birthday this week and it's always fun to have birthdays. However, this birthday, uh, my husband, we, I ended up having to take my husband to the emergency room. And we were there from, let me see, we went to an acute care center from, because the paramedics came and didn't want to, it was a nosebleed. Paramedics didn't want to take us directly to the emergency room over at Skokie Hospital because it was so crowded. They said we would be waiting for hours. So they recommended that we just go to an acute care center. So we did that, but then it, 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 my husband is, it was in such bad shape that they sent us then directly with an emergency entrance to the emergency room at Skokie, Skokie Hospital. So we were there from quarter of seven till 9.30 and they released him. And then we went home, we went and got something, we, we picked up something, Culver's Burgers, on the way home, you know, great birthday dinner, huh? And, uh, and then unfortunately, after we ate dinner, the nosebleed, my husband's nosebleed started again. So we ended up back at the hospital, but because we didn't come in with an emergency order, we had to wait our turn. We didn't get a room until 11 and we didn't see a doctor till one. Oh my God. So anyway, anyway, so. I, I, I'm, I'm showing an extra year older, <laughs> but it wasn't because I'm a year older, it's because I didn't get any sleep two nights ago. But anyway, so I'm seeing more people signing on. Welcome, welcome. I'm Jennifer Brennan, the Horticulture Information Specialist at Chalet, and you're, 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 you're signed in for the watering um, presentation. And we titled this, Tony Fulmer and I titled this, Watering the Life-Saving Habit. And um, Tony Bulmer, when he was still the retail manager of Shelley Nursery and Garden Center, 
he and I work collaboratively uh, for setting up lectures and, and topics for the Learning Center. And um, we were having to replace so many plants because of our warranties that we realized people just did not understand how to water, number one, and number two, the importance of you know, doing supplemental watering if we didn't get rainfall. And so we decided we needed to set up a lecture. So I put this together. I think it's been 18 years. It, it, it is, it's 18 years that I did the first one and did some really fun, fun research. Dr. Um, Ed Gilman out of uh, the University of Florida has done some phenomenal research that I'm gonna be sharing with you. And, um, and then I, I get updates and updated research every year. So I update this all the time. And uh, it's, it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating um, study about you know, how water is used by a plant, how water affects a plant, how lack of rainfall affects plants, and how, how is the best way to give supplemental water. You know, so, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share all that with you today. Um, we're three minutes away from the start. We've got, I've got four people attending. And um, so thank you, thank you. It's so funny uh, when we get right at the start, all the numbers start ticking, 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 ticking up. Everyone signs in, you know, closer to the, um, the start time. I'm in the top floor, the fourth floor of, we call it the Chalet Office Plaza. And that's an office building on the north side of uh, our parking lot and the north side of the, the nursery. And it's so fun because I'm sitting in an office that's looking south and I'm looking over the parking lot, but I feel like Rapunzel, you know, up here, you know, that, 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 that fun uh, nursery rhyme, or I guess it's a fairy tale where Rapunzel, Rapunzel let down your hair. Uh, Cause it's so fun to kind of look out this window. Okay, we've got six people, five people besides me, and we'll get started in another minute. And uh, welcome, welcome to the, the watering webinar. Uh, and I'm gonna share how, uh, how the best way to monitor your water, apply the water, and, um, and, and, and why. I love this slide. I, 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 I got this slide probably about 18 years ago when I was first putting this together. And it's just such a refreshing you know, slide whenever it's hot and, hot and humid and dry outside. It looks like we're supposed to get some pretty good rain tonight into tomorrow morning, which um, as a horticulturist, I don't mind all the rain. However, and I'll wait till the next slide. Uh, let me see, we've got, we've got six people besides me. Welcome, welcome. Um, Jennifer Brennan here, Horticulture Information Specialist at Chalet. And this is the watering um, lecture or webinar. And it's the life-saving habit of, you know, in how and why to water. Oh, and everyone, the numbers are ticking up, ticking up, ticking up. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Jennifer Brennan here. And this is the watering um, webinar. And we have the, um, the handout was attached to the same email as a PDF file. So you can download that and then print it up or have it on an alternate screen on your computer. We also have hard copies of it printed. I have hard copies of it at the, at the desk, uh, the diagnostic desk. Um, we also call it the plant clinic desk and it's where my microscope is. So you can, if you don't wanna, if you wanna save money on printing, come in and pick, a, pick up a handout when you're in the store. Okay, we've got 11 people. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, some public service announcements. Oh, that's not the right one. Oh, this is a good public service announcement. Uh, if you have questions, please add them at the Q&A um, column rather than the chat box uh, because um, uh, it's easier for me to keep, you know, keep um, order you know, as I'm answering the questions by using the, the Q&A uh, column. And I will answer all your questions at the end of the, uh, of the presentation. Okay, so now I'm in this spot. She says, 
Oh, don't do that. Okay, public service announcement number two. All right, tomorrow morning, starting tomorrow morning, is the Hostapalooza. And, um, and Hostapalooza is an event on Saturday and Sunday where Chalet brings in, we, we have a whole page. Oh, I, I have my page right here. I have a whole page of um, hostas. And it's they're they're from our farm, and then we also brought some in from other from other suppliers. And I managed to get them on one page by reducing the print. And this is it right here. And I'll be handing it out um, tomorrow. And I'm doing a tour of all of the hostas, and I'm going to be discussing all of all the ones that are available, uh, starting at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. So please join you know join me. Um, and the cool thing is. All of our hostas in stock are 30% off. So what a great way to add more hostas to your collection or introduce hostas to your garden. If you have shadier areas, come and join us for the Hostapalooza uh, event. And that's Saturday, tomorrow, and Sunday as well. 30% off all of the, you know, all of the, um, the hostas. We're also having phenomenal sales on almost everything else. All of our spring blooming trees, spring blooming shrubs are, are on sale. Um, all the hanging baskets are on sale. Um, and we've got, we've got three pages of, of items that are on sale. So come and enjoy great values, you know, here at, here at Chalet. Okay, now this next one. I love going to NOAA, which is um, the, 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 the national organization of weather. And so whenever I need to find out what, has, what is happening or what has happened to our area weather-wise, I, I go to the NOAA website. And this was just, I pulled this up yesterday and added it to this, this PowerPoint presentation. And it, it shows you, you know, what this, you know, this was yesterday I did this. So that was this afternoon and tonight was yesterday. This is Friday, mostly sunny, you know, then, you know, then a slight chance of thunderstorms. That doesn't happen until uh, between six. And I was watching the weather this morning, uh, at six o'clock, we have a 20% chance of rain. And then later this evening, it, it goes up to 60%. And that's gonna last all the way through tomorrow morning. So, um, and see here, you can see 50% tonight at thunderstorms into, you know, tomorrow morning, 40%. So, and then tomorrow night, 30 to 60%. And then Sunday back down to 40. And then uh, we're gonna have cooler temperatures and sunny all next week, which is really gonna, really gonna be, um, really gonna be nice to have a little bit of cooler weather. Now, what's interesting, is um, again, NOAA, I went to NOAA to find out the rainfall in July and the observed amount or the recorded amount is only 2.66 inches. Our normal amount for July should be four inches, 4.10 inches. So we're actually down an almost an inch and a half of rain. So the rule of thumb, let's keep going. Oh, and so here's, the, um, here's the NOAA chart. And, and so I did an accumulation of all of the, of the precipitation that was actually recorded. And that's where I got, that's where I got my numbers right here. Okay, so now the importance of water for the survival of plants. Okay, maintaining water, it, it's, you know, it, you have to have it as, at a necessary equilibrium. And that means, you know, the water in the roots and then the water in all the cells throughout the plant. And, and the water is pulled from the soil by the roots into the xylem. And then, and then the, the stomates on the leaves, those are the pores that open up, the cells that open up, and then it goes into the atmosphere. The way the water moves through the plant is based on a capillary action of the water molecules. They kind of are attached to each other. And, and then they pull, they actually pull each other out of the xylem and it's and, and out from the root area, which is just down in the, 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 the water source in, in the soil. And it's dependent on 
the, the amount of humidity in the ambient air surrounding the plant. And so that's why the day that we had 100 degrees, and I think that's been about three weeks, it may be a month ago, about four weeks ago now, we had 100 degree temperatures with almost 87% humidity. The humidity in the air was so high that when the stomates opened, there was no microscopic pull of those the water, water molecules through the plant. And it just sat there without the water evaporating out. There was no cooling effect. And so many plants got sunburned. Japanese maples got sunburned, even with just two hours of sun directly on the leaves. Pastas really burnt up. And I've been diagnosing that almost every day for the last month. People bring the samples and what is wrong with this plant? And that, that was that hot, hot, high humid day that caused that. So what's interesting in this research, when I was really doing this research was um, even when stems are dead on a woody plant, the water moves through the pipeline of the xylem pipeline. So that's why it's important to prune off any dead wood because that could be like an open faucet pulling water out of the plant and taking it away from the living parts of the plant. Now the water is, the movement is regulated by the opening and closing of the stomates. When the plant is hydrated, then the stomates, there's two cells on, on, in the stomate that, that when, when they're hydrated, they stay closed. They're nice and fluffy and so they stay, they stay closed. When, the, um, when, 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 when there's not enough water in the plant, those cells um, you don't have, they're not turgid and then, and then they open up. So kind of like this. So then there's that opening when the stomates open. Now, wh what happens, carbon dioxide um, moves through those open stomates. So when the plant's photosynthesizing, it's releasing the carbon dioxide back out into the atmosphere. And then, and then is, it, it is, no, excuse me, it's releasing, it's releasing oxygen, excuse me, excuse me. When those stomates are open, it's pulling the, the carbon dioxide into the plant. And that's what they use. They, they use that carbon to, to, for photosynthesis. Now, if you don't have open, you know, you, you, know, you don't have, the, the stomates aren't open or they're closed, the, the, the photosynthesis actually slows down or it actually ceases, you know, it, especially if a plant's not well hydrated. Now the symptoms, what this is a difficult thing to, 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 to share with people because the symptoms of underwatering are very similar to overwatering. So underwatering, you'll see the leaves wilting, especially of deciduous plants. You'll also see browning of the leaf margins, you know, and that's called scorch. You'll see um, the, the, a lot of the plants will drop green leaves. They wanna, they wanna get rid of that, that large surface area that can transpire and pull the water out. And then eventually um, you get root loss and then you can eventually, you know, it, it, you know, the entire, all of the foliage on the plant turns brown and ultimately the, the plant dies. Now, overwatering, ottering sometimes has the same symptoms. Okay, the number one um, it, it, of, of overwatering is you're gonna see yellowing of the lower leaves on the plant. And then you can also see wilting of the, of the leaves, especially deciduous plants, because if, 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 if the roots are overwatered, they're drowning in the soil and they can't do their job. So you get the same wilting that you would if it was underwatered. You can also get browning of the leaf margins because if no water is being taken up, you get the same, the same symptoms of being underwatered. Then you also will lose root rot, you know, you have root loss due to rotting because if there's excess water in the root zone, there's no oxygen. And then that's also the perfect environment for the water molds like Pythium and Rhizoctonium. And then you'll see chlorosis and chlorosis we saw a lot, we've seen a lot, we've seen a lot of that this season because we had such wet conditions in and good rainfall and wet conditions in April. So when the roots were trying to do their job, they, they weren't bringing as many nutrients up. So a lot of the leaves had incomplete pigmentation formed. 
So chlorosis is actually where, you know, if you look at a leaf, the, the veins, like my fingers would be like the veins, they're green and in between it's yellow and it's yellow. So that's called chlorosis. You can also get the ultimate death of a plant from, from overwatering. So this is, this is something, so when we're talking and I'm asking people about what's going on with their plants, if their plants aren't, you know, they're, they're not performing as they should, I'm always asking people, when was the last time they watered or how much they water? Okay, so there's a big differentiation. Now, the basic rules, the basic rules is that you want deep, infrequent watering to saturate the soil to a minimum of six inches, okay? So newly planted plants should be treated like intensive care patients, um, and especially um, immediately after they've been planted. And, and this is, you know, check the root balls daily for the first three weeks, then water three times a week for six weeks in a row or after that. And so it takes six to eight weeks for the roots to grow from the root ball into the surrounding soil. So that's why we say for the first you know, two to three weeks, you need to water daily. And you, you, you treat them just like they were in a bald and burlap you know, situation in the nursery yard or in containers in the nursery yard. We water those, we water our plants every day. And so you wanna do that when they're out there, when they're first planted in the ground, because the roots are in that root ball mass rather than in the surrounding soil. So you have to make sure that root ball stays moist. Now, after the first two to three weeks, then you're gonna water every other day because you want the soil and the root ball to dry out a bit to pull oxygen down in. And roots metabolize, they don't photosynthesize, so they need oxygen. So you have to be very conscious of the water needs for the first one to three years until plants are, um, are highly established, you know, until they're established. And by doing that, you're, encu you're encu encouraging a, a healthy root system. And, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll note you the exceptions of the rules on this. Okay, here we go. Um, next question, next slide, I can make it on the right screen. Oh, okay, so now this is, this is my house with my sprinkler system. And you can see how it's a pulsating system rather than an oscillating system. This actually was an old, old golf course sprinkler system that was put in the house when the house was built back in 1949. The gentleman that built the house was from International Harvester and he had access to all these um, professional systems. I, I joke with people, this is the reason that my first husband and I bought, bought the house. Um, he was, a, he was a, an, a former golf course um, superintendent and he was in love with that sprinkler system. So funny. Okay, so now the guideline is that plants need one inch of rain or the equivalent in supplemental watering every week when the temperatures are 75 degrees or cooler. So every 10 degrees above 75, you need to add another half inch of rain to keep our, the plants happy and the lawns happy. So that means at 95 degrees, we should be getting two inches of rain a week. So now to prevent transpiration stress at higher temperatures like 85 and 95, I recommend instead of doing one deep watering a week um, that you wanna uh, water two to three times each, each, each week, because that prevents, and, and, and the reason for that is that if you drink a gallon of, um, of water on a Sunday and you didn't drink water for a whole week, you would probably be pretty thirsty by the next week when it, when it, came, when it comes around. So, um, so, so that's why I like to encourage people to divide it up. And then, you know, so if, if, you're, if you're trying to get an inch and a half of water each week, you set your sprinklers up and then water at a half inch each application you know, each time. And I'm gonna show you how to figure that out. Now, the, the, the factors affecting watering needs, the plant type, the season, the light conditions, the humidity levels, the, show, the soil type, whether the plants are mulched or not, and if it's an established plant or it's a first year transplant, and if it was a container versus a bald and burlap plant. And I'll go over all those details. Now, these, these are some, uh, when we talk about the plant types, um, hydrangeas, hydra is, you know, water. These plants definitely need, you know, like adequate water at the right time. If they don't get it at the right time, 
they really wilt out and they really get damaged. Okay, so the characteristics and requirements of different plants are very important. So if you have large soft leaves like hydrangeas, it's more surface area and higher transpiration rates. Needled evergreens, they're waxier, they have a heavier cuticle and they don't lose as much water as quickly. Broadleaf evergreens have a waxy cuticle, but they have a, a larger you know, surface area. And then they're the deciduous versus evergreen with the benefit for survival. The, the deciduous plants drop their leaves so they don't have to worry about in any, of, any of the transpiration. Evergreens, you do have to be, you know, you have to be, make sure they get very well hydrated because they're, they're out and exposed to the cold temperatures and the high winds all winter long. Now, gray or fuzzy leaves, they have um, um, like, like the stachys that's right down here um, you know, the, in the bottom photo. They actually have that fuzz to help hold the humidity around the surface of the leaves so they don't need to be watered nearly as frequently. And, and then and that actually holds the humidity around the surface of the leaf. Now, the season is also really important. So winter and early spring, we have frozen soils and below freezing temperatures, and, but we do have high winds. But when the soils are frozen, the, the plant can't bring any, they can't bring any water up to, you know, to the surface. Uh, in summer and fall, we do have rain, we have rainfall, but we have higher temperatures and we also have high winds, you know, in that season as well. So again, depending on which season you're dealing with is, you know, how you, how you, you know, decide how to water. Light conditions are also very important. Sunny, um, you know, the, it, the, it's also, you know, it's, it's very temperature dependent. You know, if it's a cooler day in full sun, you, you not have to be as worried about, you know, the transpiration and the water. Time of day, you know, morning versus afternoon, you know, it's, you know, it's sun in the morning isn't nearly as, um, as stressful on plants as sun on, a, on the leaves in, in a, a, a warmer afternoon. So again, follow the basic rule of one inch of rain per week at 75 degrees or cooler. It's much, much better to water earlier in the day and, and than in the late afternoon. You wanna have the plants going into the day already hydrated. It's like starting a race. You wanna be hydrated before you get going to the race. And then you wanna hour, if you're gonna water later in the afternoon, you wanna allow three to four hours for the foliage to dry before it gets dark. Because if, it go, if they go to bed, if they go to sleep at night when it's dark, um, and the leaves are wet, that's the perfect condition for the fungal leaf spot diseases. Uh, now, if it's in shade, shade is cooler, you know, even, you know, it's always cooler in the shade. Uh, you have less transpiration, less water needs. And again, in the shade, you really wanna avoid watering late because the foliage will tend to stay wetter in the shade. It won't dry off as quickly as, 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 as they do in the, um, in the sun. So in the shade, you tend to have more fungal problems and also more slug problems. Now, again, soil type is, is, is really important to understand. Heavy clay, the drainage, you can understand the drainage of a clay soil by testing how it drains, by digging, digging an eight inch deep hole and you know, filling it with, you know, with water. And if it drains within, you know, within eight hours, it's good drainage, four to eight hours. If it stands, then you then you it's it's not it's considered poor drainage. You can add organic matter. You can add clay, uh, calcined clay particles like the the clay um, cell perfector. You mulch. You only need to mulch with two inches of mulch um, to help keep the cell temperatures and moisture levels more consistent. And the clay actually holds more minerals and nutrients if you can get the drainage you know ad adequate. Now sand. Sand, the particles are much larger. It drains much more quickly. It doesn't hold water. Um, so you need to add organic you know, amendments to sand just as much as you do to, to clay. To, you know, to, now that the organic matter in, in sand helps hold moisture you know, around and with smaller particles. Peat moss is okay for sand. We don't recommend it at all for clay, you know, for clay soils. Um, now sand does require more nutrient additions because it has a very low cation exchange capacity. Clay, clay cells have very high CEC, sand has very low CEC. So with sand, you can get by mulching up to four inches deep to help keep the cell more uniformly moist. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gonna get another sip of tea. Next slide. As I mentioned with mulch, 
we recommend, shall I recommend to use organic mulches only, not stone mulches to keep the soil moisture and the temperatures more consistent. So you wanna use things like shredded bark mulch, chunk bark, um, leaf mold mulch, pine needles, and then the newest research, um, the research from Dr. Ed Gilman, um, a lot of times bark-based mulch directly over the whole root ball for the first year can be detrimental because the bark absorbs all of the water and doesn't release it. So you really have to have a lot of rain. We have to water excessively to, get, to make sure you get the soil moist. So be careful about that. And then also avoid any stone mulches for plant root zones, because the stones heat up during the day, especially if they're in sun, and then they hold that heat all night, and you get the same effect of braising. Like when you braise meats, you braise the roots because the temperature doesn't go down like the plant requires for metabolic activity. Okay, now again, these are the types of mulch, and we have the leaf mulch, which is in the upper, the upper uh, left-hand slide, then the cotton mur cotton burr compost is over on the right side. Shredded pine bark is on the lower left, and then shredded hardwood is on the on the lower right. I actually prefer um, the shredded types of, of wood mulches, just because you know they, they they tend to knit together, so they don't wash away like and and float away like the chunk bark mulches do. Okay, now this is a great example of um, you know, the, the benefit of not having um, rock or stone mulches around plants. See these two arborvitae? And these were on a, at a gas station just south of Chalet on Skokie, Skokie Boulevard. And uh, they're no longer there. But you can see how the arborvitae that was predominantly mulched with the stones completely died out. And that was because of the reflective heat from the concrete curb the asphalt and those and those stones, whereas the larger one in the back was at least surrounded, and a lot of that root system probably went over into the the, the lawn area, so it was not near as um, as hot, and you know, and it, and I'm sure there was no supplemental uh, watering given to either of those plants when we didn't have enough rain. But that this is the perfect example of a why you don't do stone mulches. Turf damage, we see a lot of turf damage especially where we've had sod laid and, um, and, and, and if it isn't, if the edges aren't, you know, really, you know, really tamped down and anchored down, air gets underneath them. And then this was also a problem because of the hot curb. And then that, that, that sod just completely, you know, dried out and it wasn't completely watered like it should be. Now, this is kind of the rule of, of, of turf. If you have established versus new turf, it's a half a water. What this is interesting, a half water per month will keep the, and that's rainfall, will keep the crowns alive, but the, the, the grass plants will go dormant. That means it'll brown. And, and so you, when, you're, when, you're, when you're doing and planting, you know, like new turf, you want to inspect it daily for those first three to four weeks, especially if it's newly planted. Now, if it's seed, you have to keep seed consistently moist through the germination period plus four weeks. And that can be four mows. And you wanna make sure you water every day. And it's the only time we recommend you water every day. Now with sod, it's light syringing two times a day for the first three to four weeks. And you, you wanna make sure that sod feels like a damp sponge. And you do that until the roots have grown into the soil, we call that knitted in, if it knits into the soil. And you can test that by gently trying to pull the sod up. You know, don't yank it, but you know, if, you, if, you see a, if you feel a little resistance, you know the roots have started to grow in. Now for herbaceous plants, annuals, container plants may need to be watered two times daily on temperatures like we're having right now, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. Um, the, with a, 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 the flowering beds of annuals, the basic rule, you just follow that basic rule, an inch of rain at 75 degrees or cooler, an extra half inch every, you know, every, you know, for every 10 degrees above. And you do this, you know, if the plants are established, if they're not established, water every other day until they get established. Now, if you're only using uh, automatic sprinklers, 
you want to group similar plants together so that the timing of each zone, you know, you have plants that if, 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 you're, if your timing of that zone is longer, you know, it's plants that are going to, that are going to be, you know, happy in moister soil, moister soil. Now with perennials, you need to really learn each plant's watering requirements, you know, so, you know, so there, there are plants that are more, more drought tolerant after they're established and then plants that like, you know, like caviar water. So you learn all, you know, come and talk to us at Chalet. We have wonderful information we can share with you. Okay, so now you need to treat plants again like intensive care patients for those first six to eight weeks as the roots are growing out of the root ball into the surrounding soil. So that's the first two weeks, everyday watering. And then after, after that, for the next, the next six weeks after that, every other day, to get them established. And then after they're established, follow that basic rule. Okay, here we go. Now this, this is, it's so easy to see, um, you know, evergreen damage. And these are arborvitaes and yews. And then this is a globe arborvitae down, down the front. And boy, it, you, you really have to be conscientious. Don't just rely on a sprinkler system to water uh, newly planted plants. You, it's best to hand water those plants and I'm gonna give you some, a neat tip on, on how to do that properly. Now with deciduous trees, boy, this was a, this was a sad, sad plant. It was a, tree, a, tree, a street tree that was planted along um, Sunset Ridge Road. As I was driving around, I, I saw it. And you could see how this poor thing, um, you know, that you could see where the, the, the leaves that were formed early, just as it was planted, large regular sized leaves. But then you can see the chlorosis, um, you know, and, and the brown tips uh, because it didn't get any supplemental water. This, this tree actually died. You know, I kept watching it and it completely died. So, so these are the signs that you need to, you know, make sure. And this is another, this is classic scorch damage on, um, on a maple. You can see the chlorosis and then the classic scorch where the, with the brown tissue in between the veins is called intervenal necrosis. That means dead tissue in between the veins. Plants always try to save their veins, uh, you know, in their leaves because they know the veins will keep carrying the water no matter what. But you know, if there's not enough water to go around, those, those cells in the middle really get they get burnt. I'm seeing a lot of this on a lot of, and here's another example. On um, this is on a birch. Now, again, woody plants, you know, and you know, until they're if they're established follow that basic rule. And I, I'm so amazed at people that, you know, when I ask if they're watering trees, when they bring samples in, they said, well, it's a tree that's been there for years and years and years. It doesn't need any extra. And I'm like, whoa, if we don't get rain, you need to give even established trees. We should set that sprinkler up underneath that, that beautiful old tree. And at least once a week, let the sprinkler, you know, you know oscillate over the entire root system for a full hour. It really is the best thing you can do. Now, newly planted woody plants, if they're potted or container plants, you wanna hand water, hand water that root ball two to three times a week. Um, and and the, my favorite way is to learn how to divide the root ball into quadrants and then hold a watering wand right over each quadrant. And I, I've got a slide to talk about that in a little bit. Now, established in plants, if it's, if it's a, it, it takes one year for a shrub to become established, three years if it's a tree. If it's bald and burlapped, they usually are in heavier soils rather than container plants. And, and but when they dig up um, a, a, you know, a plant, 60 to 80% of the roots are left in the field. Now, Tony Fulmer came up with a really cool, we call it Tony's hot tip. And before you plant a new plant out in your garden, Set it in the location where it'll be planted in the garden and then practice watering it while it's still above ground. So you take, if it's a bald and burlap plant, take that, you know, your watering wand or your sprayer, hold it over and see how long it takes so that water is actually running through and then running out of the bottom of the root ball. You know, not just running off, but, you know, really saturating. And then, you know, that's how long it's going to take to do that to that root ball, you know, when that plant is planted in the ground. Now, uh, you can also use a watering can to see how much volume it takes to thoroughly moisten the root ball, and then you know how many watering cans to use. Okay, so then you wanna follow that frequency and that volume for that whole growing season until that plant is established. Now, um, I, I, I developed a tip 
and it's been really helpful for, for you know for you know helping people understand and again treating plants like intensive care patients for the first six to eight weeks because it takes that six to eight weeks for the plants to the roots to grow out of the root ball in the surrounding soil so you want to divide you want to use a watering wand and hand water I like the longer wand so you don't have to bend over you just hold it over and mentally divide the root ball into quadrants hold the watering wand over quadrant one and count to your head in your head one two three four five then with the water running, move over to quadrant two, count one, two, three, four, five. Then quadrant three, count to five and quadrant four and do that two to three times around. And it takes three minutes. And if you do that, you'll be amazed how what a, a better efficiency um, that you're getting in, in, in getting that root ball you know, watered. And then you wanna keep treating that patient like an intensive care patient for the next six weeks after the first two and watering every other day. And you wanna, you wanna avoid watering every day for the, the whole establishment period because that's gonna prevent the, you know, the plant from getting, um, the roots from getting oxygen. So you wanna make sure that you know, you really, you know, you're really um, you know, helping the plant get the oxygen as well. And don't just keep watering every day. All right, okay, here we go. And this shows, Dave, I love having that watering wand because you can hold it directly over the root ball and then, you know, and actually, actually, you're not just wetting the leaves of the plant like the sprinkler system would do. You're actually getting the water right down into the, into the root area. Now, oh, this is one of my, one of my coworkers. She had, um, and this was last year, she had this new landscape put in and she was hand watering doing the, the, the four quadrant. And look, look how great they did. And that was, last year was the summer from hell. For, for, for growing because it was so hot and, and we weren't getting nearly the amount of water we should get. Look how gorgeous this, this did. Okay, so now this, is, and this was the research from Dr. Ed Gilman from the University of Florida. And there's actually you know, the management after transplanting and you have either watering for vigor or watering for survival. And so this, you know, for vigor, this are, these are people that are actually producing plants and you want the plants to actively grow. And, but survival, that means you're you know, like a park or a golf course or a home. You just, wanna, you just wanna get the plant growing and you wanna have it part of your landscape. So an, an under two inch caliper tree, and again, after the first two weeks, you wanna water twice you know, weekly for two to three months. For a two to four inch caliper twice weekly for three to four months. And then over four inch twice weekly, weekly for four to five months. So, so I, I'm gonna emphasize the, you know, the, 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 the schedule for survival rather than, than bigger. But it, what's interesting is you, know, you can see this matches a lot of what I was saying about newly planted you know, trees and shrubs, newly planted anything. You water daily for the first two weeks and then every other day for two months. And then again, daily for a month on, on that you know, one to two, you know, two to four inch caliper and then daily for four weeks on a four inch caliper tree. And that's just cause that root ball you know, can, can really dry out. Okay, now the tools, the best tools, irrigation systems, we have sprinklers, we have the oscillating types. You can lose uh, as much as 30 to 60% of the water depending on the time of day that you're using an oscillating sprinkler. And that's the one that throws the water up and it goes back and forth and back and forth. Pulsating sprinklers actually flow, throw the water directly out and it, it gets delivered much more quickly and not as much evaporation. Now there are hoses that are soakers and weepers. And um, I, I love, I love the, the, like a soaker hose and um, like the old fashioned, sprinklers that was the, the flat you know hose that and the spray came up and we ran through them in, in our bathing suits if you turn that one upside down it the water goes directly into the soil so i like especially newly planted like rows of arborvitae i like to encourage people to take one of those soaker hoses turn it upside down and put it on on one side of you know of the row of the of, of, of the arborvitaes with it, you know, like halfway through the edge of the root ball. Then take the other one on the other side, use a splitter 
take the hose out to the bed that, you know, the hose from the faucet and then put a splitter on it and then do the two soakers off of that. You may have to only run one soaker at a time, depending on your water pressure. Now in the in-ground sprinkler systems, don't rely on the sprinkler people to set the amount of time. You, you wanna request it that they calibrate to actually measure the amount of water that is being delivered when after the sprinkler has been running. And this is how you calibrate your irrigation system. And it's just as easy as it's just measuring how much water gets delivered. And this, you can tell turf guys did this one, but I like to put one container next to where the sprinkler head is, one halfway through the field and one at the very end of the field. And then after the sprinkler has run, and then I check to see how much is in each of the containers. Your goal is to get a half inch in the, the container in the middle of the field. And, and, and that it's just measuring how much is delivered. Now in my house, my sprinkler system, it takes 30 minutes. So I run, if I haven't had, and I have a rain gauge to monitor how much rain actually is delivered at my house. If I don't get the you know, required amount, like an inch and a half that week, then I set my sprinkler system up and I turn it on so it runs like a half hour, you know, every other day, you know, for the next week. These are the soakers. This is like an oozing, an oozing soaker hose. And then this is the oscillating one that goes back and forth and back and forth. And then this is, this is a pulsating. Oh my gosh, this is um, my house from about 15 years ago. And I don't have my new planting bed there. And here's mine just from uh, last year. And you can see all my great big trees and you can see my sprinklers that are turned on and with my shade garden right in the front bed right there. Okay, so now when you're hand watering, you either use watering cans, you can use the wands that have the breakers or the rose heads on them. You wanna break that flow so it doesn't just flood and wash soil away. There are bubblers. I'm, I'm not as happy with bubblers as, as a lot of people are. You have to move them around on the root ball. A lot of people just think you can put the bubbler and leave it for uh, all day, but you just get one side watered. Water moves up and down vertically it rarely moves horizontally. And then root feeders, I think they're a waste of time and energy. And, and you, if you're gonna use a root feeder, you wanna only insert it in the top six inches of the soil. Most people jam it all the way down to like eight in, 18 inches deep and you're putting the water too deep. All the roots are in the top six, you know, six to eight inches of the soil in our heavy clay soils. So, so I'd rather have somebody just set a sprinkler up under a tree and let it run for an hour. Not, not, don't waste your time. It's so labor intensive because you're sticking that, that feeder in, in that, uh, that water, you know, the feeder uh, in every 12 inches. And it, it, it's just a waste of time and, and, and energy, I think. Here are the watering wands. And these are called the rose heads, you know, where it, it, it's like, it, it breaks so many holes, break it up so it's like a shower, a gentle shower when the water goes through. And then I love the DRAM company because these are the thumb controls. And you can see that's my thumb and that's in the off position. And you just one, one, one thumb, push it to the on position, on, off, on, off. And you're, you've got a hand free also. So they, these are the, the they're, they're one of the best that we have out there. Now containers should be watered daily, you know, especially when the, the temperatures are high and the wind is high. And, you know, you can use the acrylic polymers, you know, soil moist in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the soil for containers. It holds um, 200 times its weight in water and then releases the water and it can save you from losing plants if, you're, if, you're, if you don't have someone to water, you know, you're not doing a good job watering. Now there are advantages and disadvantages of, of different types of watering. You wanna avoid wet soil or wet, wet foliage. You know, when you have a sprinkler system, uh, you lose a lot with evaporation with the sprinkler system. And you 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 can't you, you don't have selective area watering. Now, this is the kind of the the bottom line or the very end of of this. You know, you want to avoid a landscape of drought and neglect. And this is one you have to be careful when I'm driving around with my camera. Um, I found this. Oh, I think I found this about 15 years ago, and it was a, a newly planted landscape that just didn't get the right amount of water, and it was it really showed. And this is, this is the view out of my front window 
looking at my sprinklers uh, running at, in, in my yard. It's just such a fun, it's a, a fun thing to watch, you know, when we're doing that. And, 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 and at the very end, may your red buds never look like this, you know, where they just didn't get enough, enough water and um, they're just kind of trying to re-sprout from the root system. So, okay, and I think that's it for it. Um, I'm gonna get out of um, the sharing. I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'm going to, we have 32 people, thank you so much. What I'm gonna do is um, pull these questions up. And here we go. Okay, Megan, how do you check the root ball? That is an excellent question. So what you wanna do is take your finger and there are things, there, there, are, there are watering, um, you, know, you know, soil testers that you can buy, but a lot of people put them too deep, too deeply. So I just take my finger and I, 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 I put it like four inches away from where the, the stem is in the ground or the trunk's in the ground and feel, I work it down to the top, like in, into about an inch. And if I can't feel moisture, then that's, that means I have to water. Great question, very great question. Okay, and then Roseanne Sawyer, all right. I have an eight foot, 15 year old cranberry viburnum. I just recently, and just recently about one third of the shrub was totally wilted. The rest looks okay. Any ideas about what has happened? You know, Ros uh, Roseanne, um, the viburnums um, can get um, a, an insect um, called uh, viburnum borer. And it looks like a wasp, it looks like a black wasp. And they lay eggs uh, about six to eight inches from the ground on stems, you know, on, like on the outer edges of the stems. And then when those eggs hatch, the, the larva burrows in, chews all the vascular system away, and that part of the plant can wilt. And it's pretty, you know, when you, in, when you walk up to one of the wilted branches, and if you tug on it, sometimes it'll snap off right where, uh, the borer had, had had entered. So first of all, look to see, and, and the nice thing is it has nothing to do with watering. That that's an insect problem. So you can treat with the systemic insecticides like the the, the bio advanced um, and or the uh, bonide, and you just mix it according to the height of the plant. It's three ounces per foot in a gallon of water, and pour that, and that will help prevent and and kill any of the larvae. That are in you know the in the rest of the plant, okay and um, yeah, okay that was a great question. All right now uh, Donna Dow, how does quar rate for mulch? Oh, quar is wonderful. Quar um, is it's an excellent fiber, and um, what's nice about quar is it dries out um, better than the bark does, and when you add it into like a, a potting mix. It's really good. Now, after saying that, quar might might dry out more quickly, and um, but it can be beneficial if it's a, it's a, it's a mulch and we have a rainier season. So you know, so just be aware of the fact that it will dry out more quickly than a bark mulch will. Okay, great question. You know, great question. All right. Now this is Liz Garvey. Are there some plants that? naturally have that chlorotic look? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, I, I have to tell you that um, there a lot of people like the golden colored foliage or the aria type plants, but to me, it looks like they've got chlorosis or it looks like they need nitrogen. So, so I'm going to be real brave to say, no, there are no plants that naturally have that chlorotic look. Um, there, uh, well, I have to be careful. There are some um, variegated plants that 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 they're selected because of the variegation, but I honestly think to have green veins and and yellow intervenal tissue it is is not not something that is um, done intentionally. Okay, I I yeah that, that was a that's a, that was a very interesting question. Okay, uh, now PB. Uh, a three foot wide black Veradet container on my front stoop faces east and gets very hot in the morning. I struggle with plant choice during summer. Zinnias stretch sideways, reach more sun, 
on the side of the building in the afternoon. I think other plants can't handle the blazing morning sun and fizzle out. Um, you know, I, I think a plant that would, would work okay and be pretty nice is one of the annual vincas. It's called catharanthus. And you know, try that or try some of the try some of the um, the more succulent type plants. And I think I think you'll have you'll have pretty good luck, Phoebe. Good, 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 good question. Okay, then Shelly, is it okay to allow grass to grow up to the tree trunk? Oh, that's a that's a good question. I, I say no. Uh, you're better off to at least have um, at least have um, you know like uh, 12 inches away from the trunk. Uh, where it's, where it's just soil, because the grass will tend to really impede, um, you know, and 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 compete with the the it's called the root collar. Uh, and then the other problem you have is when people try to trim the grass, they'll take the, um, the the edgers, and that can damage the the bark on the tree if you're using the whip type edgers. And in, in if you're hand trimming, but nobody does that anymore. They're always using you know like the whip edgers. So much better to keep, you know, an area at least 12 inches ar around where the root collar is cleared from, um, um, you know, turf. Good, good question. Okay, and then this is uh, Ely. Ely, uh, I have tomato plants that are yellowing. They are planted next to other tomato plants that are thriving. They are all watered every other day and fertilized on schedule. So I'm perplexed as to why these two plants are stressed. Um, you know, it, it could be different varieties have different, um, you know, different, um, um, I, was, I won't say, um, it, it, well, I, the, other, the other thing I would love to see a sample of those yellow leaves, just to make sure that you're not getting any kind of a leaf spot disease on them, because they can get early blight and that, that can cause the, the yellowing. If you're not seeing any spotting as well as the yellowing, um, it could just be a different cultivar or different variety. And a lot of the heirlooms are heavier feeders. So, and, and again, depending on what kind of fertilizer you're using, and I know it's always, it's always difficult when you've got a plant right next to it that looks great and you've got one that's not, you know, you know, that, that, you know that, that's not looking perfect and you're treating them the same way. You know, check to see which varieties they are and come in and well, and let me know which they are and, and I'll, I'll be able to find an answer for you. All right? Okay, here's one more. It, oh, it is an heirloom and no spots. I use Espoma organic tomato food. Okay, with the Espoma, uh, the Espoma will last 30 days. So make sure you're reapplying every 30 days with the Espoma. The Dr. Earth will last 60 days. So, so I think, I think it's, I think it's a nutrient, a nutrient value. Okay. Thanks for getting that, that information so quickly. Very good. Very good. Okay. And then this is Megan again. What is the watering role of thumb for plants like astilbes that generally like moist soil? Still the one inch per week rule. Yeah. One inch per week at 75 degrees. And so for the, you know, for every 10 degrees above, you know, another, you know, an, you want it, another uh, half inch of rain or supplemental water, you know, great, great question. And the, see the benefit with Estobias is they tend to be in more shade. And so, you know, so that that one and a half inch is usually really adequate. Now, if it's Estobias that's in the sun, I would water them more frequently. And they're the, the, the Pumila types, the, the ones that are coloring up right now that are purple, those, those are more sun tolerant. So we tend to have more of those in, in the sun situation. So yes, water them more frequently. Great questions, great questions. Okay, and then here we go. Uh, got it, I'll try that, thank you. And then here's anonymous. What kind of fertilizer would you recommend for honeysuckle? Uh, I, it, I'm, I'm gonna assume it's a honeysuckle vine. And my favorite, you don't want to give it a lot of nitrogen because it'll just grow like crazy and take over. So my favorite is the um, the budding bloom booster from Dr. Earth. It has a nine percent phosphorus, so it'll really promote all the great fragrant flowers. And it only has a four percent nitrogen, so you're not going to get a lot of excess green growth. Okay. All right. All right. Um, this is the, the last answer. A question, I should say. And 
We're good, we're good. I'm finishing about 10 minutes early. Here's another one. Uh, the honeysuckle looks like a, a, sh oh, a shrub, or a, so it's a shrub. All right, um, well then if it's a shrub honeysuckle, um, I would use holly tone on it. It's a 433 and it has the 5% um, the sulfur. And then you're just gonna use one cup per foot of branch spread and just sprinkle that right underneath the, the plant, right on the ground, okay? Thanks, I just love this, I mean, I'm, you know, getting the, getting the questions and, and just backing it right back up. Thank you so much. All right, all right, I think we're good. Oh, here's another one from Jan. How does watering in summer affect tulip daffodil and other bulbs? Well, okay, if you've got tulip daffodil and other bulbs in the ground dormant and you've planted plants that love a lot of water on top of them, that is probably not a wise decision. So I, 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 I because if you're watering so much to keep ferns and begonias and, and, and things like that, you could be rotting your, your, your bulbs. I like to encourage people to plant you know, the bulbs in hot sunny locations so they bake you know, all summer long. And then you plant plants like vinca and, and you know, zinnias, you know, plants that can get dry in between waterings um, you know, and, and, then, and then the bulbs last much better. Great, great, great question, great question. Okay, and then here's PB again. Thanks for another great and helpful presentation. Appreciate your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And I'll be, I'm going to sign up. It's five minutes until. And um, uh, thank you for joining me. And, and come and see me um, in, in the nursery. All right. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.